I have a, a question that's going to sound strange to you this morning, but I'm going to ask it anyway. And the question is, is God fair? Now, before you jump, so of course God's fair. Without thinking about it, I want you to I want you to consider some of the episodes that we read about in Scripture. How about the the story of Nadab and Abihu, who we find we uh, learned in Exodus approached the altar, God's altar, after just shortly after being made priests with their father Aaron. And it says, the scripture says they approach the altar with strange fire, but it doesn't talk too much about what that is, except obviously it wasn't the right type of offering to bring before the altar or, or approach to make to the altar, and God killed them instantly. And then, and then didn't even allow father Aaron to grieve. How about Ananias and Sapphira? Read about their story in Acts, where they had some land that they sold and were donated part of it to the work of the disciples, to the main maintenance of the community that was gathered there and in Jerusalem for after Pentecost. And when asked if he had sold the land for so and so, he he lied to Peter, and Peter said that you lied not to me but to the Holy Spirit, and he instantly dropped dead. Now, yes, he lied, but death? And then when his wife came in, Peter repeated the question to her, and she confirmed what her husband had said, and of course she died as well, and they carried her out right after carrying out her husband. And you can say, well, yes, but, you know, they did something wrong. So may uh, they have a penalty, perhaps death's a little harsh, but, but they had done what God told them not to do. And, and, and Ananias and Sapphira, they had lied to the Holy Spirit. But what about the example of Uzzah? Remember when King David was bringing the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem after a long absence, and he was, they were traveling down, and it, they had the Ark of, on a cart pulled by oxen, and, Dan, and David was dancing before the ark. He was, so, he was so filled with joy that the ark was coming back to, to its home. And they, the oxen stumbled on something, and it looked like the ark of the covenant of God was going to fall off the cart, and Uzzah just reached out his hand to stabilize it, and God instantly struck him dead. Have we never thought that that just didn't seem fair? Or how about the death of women and children along with the, the Canaanites and the inhabitants of the land when Israel came in. Surely the warriors, the men perhaps, but to kill little children as well? Was that fair? Have we never, has that never crossed our mind? Well, I think if we're honest, brethren, must, some of us at least must admit that we've been really disturbed or maybe angered because our sense of fairness was disrupted by what God did. And you know, it seems like fairness is, is a, so it's an innate thing with us. Even little children, have you ever not seen little children going, that's not fair. He got more than me, that's not fair. He gets a step later than me, that's not fair. Where do they get, why, how, I wonder, where do they get this concept of fairness? It just seems to be born in them. We have this sense of fairness. Well, I think the reason we have difficulty with, with some of the things that God has done is because we do not understand holiness, justice, sin, and grace. And it's important that we understand the relationship between all of these because they all interact. But this sermon today isn't going to be about the relationship between all four. I would primarily like to touch on the relationship between justice and grace. Because at first glance, they seem like perhaps polar opposites. Justice, 
justice, and grace. To us, the concept of justice has a notion of fairness directly involved in it. It's almost as if fairness and justice are one and the same thing. And at first glance, it may, no, may not seem as though fairness was even considered by God in his dealings with the folks I just mentioned. And we may even say, say several others as well. Well, justice is defined by Webster as the maintenance or administration of what is just. In actual practice, it's seen as uh, the restoration of equality. You know, something's not equal, so we restore it, and that's fair. The word just is defined as reasonable, conforming to a standard of correctness, acting on conformity with what is morally upright or good. And the synonyms for the word just are fair and upright. And this is very close to the way the Bible uses them. So we may define the Bible's definition of justice as conformity to a rule or standard. However, the Bible's norm or standard is God's own holy character. There's the difference. Not man, what man decides is fair or right, but what God determines by his holy character. Not a set of laws or a set of statutes we might have in our mind because we relate to the governments of men. Basically, justice is measured against God's holy character because God is just. God is, by his very nature, a just God. And God's holy character is reflected verbally in his law, or you, may, you might say more broadly, in his word. To begin, I would like to go back and look at one of these scriptures where Abraham asks a question of God. Turn with me, if you will, to Genesis chapter 18. This, of course, is where the Lord and two angels were approaching Abraham and he entertained them there for a while. I actually had a meal with the pre-incarnate Christ. And they were going, they, they had told him that they were going down to, they were going down to um, Sodom and Gomorrah because the sins had risen before God's throne. And they went to, were going down to confirm, as if they didn't know already, what was actually happening there. And of course, Lot and his, and his family lived in Sodom, so Abraham obviously had an interest. And so he asks in, eight, in Genesis 18, verse 23, and Abraham came near and said, What would you, would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there were 50 righteous within the city. Would you also destroy the place and not spare it for the 50 righteous that were in it? Far, it be, far be it from you to do such a thing as this, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous should be as the wicked. Far be it from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? So Abraham was actually questioning or apparently questioning God about his justice, his fairness. Now, I use this verse as a basis for explaining that God's justice is according to his righteousness, his holy character. And Psalm 119, verse 172, you don't need to turn there, but just if you want to write that down, because if you want a good definition of righteousness, Psalm 119, 172, and it's a single line that says, All your commandments... Our righteousness. Those commandments reflect are reflected in the writing, are reflect in writing actually the very character of God. You want to know about God? Read his word. Look at his commandments. And what God does is always consistent with who and what he is and what he has written. His righteousness is absolute purity. He is utterly incapable of an unholy, unrighteous, 
unjust act. He couldn't do it because by his very character he cannot do it. It is totally beyond him to do any such thing. For God to act unfairly, he would simply have to cease being God. It is totally impossible for him to do something that would be injustice. So when Abraham uses the word righteous, as in would you destroy the righteous with the wicked, he's not saying would you destroy the sinless with the wicked. He's not saying that these people are sinless. He means people who through the fear of God are being conscientious about that, have kept themselves free from the iniquity of the cities. And the cities, of course, were Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham's concern was that there were people in the city we might consider to be really good upright citizens who were trying their best to live God's way but perhaps had been influenced somewhat by the city. They weren't sinless. But if there was a fear of God in them, maybe they were trying with all their might to obey God. And like I said, simply caught up in the environment which God had decided he was going to destroy. But this shows something about Abraham's character, does it not? And his understanding of God. Abraham knew well enough that he could rely on God that even if there were ten righteous people there, God's judgment would be absolutely fair. Even if there was one, there was the possibility that God would intervene for this one person's sake. Abraham knew that, you see. So what he was doing wasn't all that outrageous. Now, God does not always act with justice. Sometimes he acts with mercy. And this is what he did with Lot and his family. You see, God acted with justice with the city because it was so corrupt, so evil, so filled with sin that it offended God's sense of what is right and wrong. It offended God's patience. It offended God's long-suffering. And so in justice, he wiped the city off the map. But in grace and mercy, he spared Lot, Lot's wife, and two children. Now, mercy is not justice. That's true. But neither is it injustice. Because injustice would violate righteousness. And God always, of course, acts according to his holy character, which is totally righteous. So therefore, mercy which manifests manifest kindness and grace, mercy does no violence to righteousness. And we may see non-justice in God, which is mercy, but we never see injustice in God. So again, the question, is God fair in his dealings with men? Consider this. God warned man what he was going to earn in the way of the death penalty if he sinned. Did he not? Throughout Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, God warned man. Listen to this partial list, brethren. God warned that man or woman would die if he or she struck or cursed his or her parents. Death penalty. Desecrated a sacrifice. Death penalty. Murdered someone, death penalty. Kidnapped someone, death penalty. Sacrificed a child in the fire, death penalty. Took God's name in vain, death penalty. Broke the Sabbath, death penalty. Consulted mediums, death penalty. Practiced homosexuality or incest, death penalty. Practiced bestiality, death penalty. Raped someone, death penalty gave false prophecy, again, death penalty, practiced sorcery, sacrificed to a false god, committed adultery, desecrated a holy thing, disagreed with God's judgment, played a harlot when you were a priest's daughter, all carried the death penalty. And that's only a partial list. God has clearly made it available to mankind what the penalty for sin is. Is God acting fairly? The penalty for some of these offenses may sound really harsh to modern minds. Death for a false prophecy, death for committing adultery, death for bestiality or homosexuality, all of these penalties are given in the Old Testament. 
By contrast, there is no list of such things in the New Testament, and this, of course, has led some to think that they prefer the God of the New Testament to that harsh God of the Old Testament. But the God of the New Testament, brethren, as we well know, is exactly the same being as the God of the Old Testament. And he says, I change not. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now let's go back. Let's go back even further than Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Let's go back to Genesis. And let's look at the instructions given to Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 2. Notice what God told them. Genesis 2 verse 17. He lays it out pretty clear here. Genesis 2, 17. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day you eat of it you shall surely die. And just as an aside, you don't need to turn here, but you might want to d- jot down Ezekiel 18, 4. Ezekiel 18, 4. Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sins shall die. Brethren, in the beginning, at creation, all sin is deemed worthy of death. All sin. Every sin is a capital offense. Now let's think about this a little further. In creation, God was not obligated in any way to give you or me life. He's not obligated. He doesn't owe you life. He doesn't owe me life. He doesn't owe anybody life. He's not indebted to us at all. Life is a gift to us that puts us under an obligation. And that obligation is stated, or at least implied very strongly, right when man is being created. He says, let us make man in our image. So God gave life to man and put him under the obligation of being the image bearer of God. That was his obligation, to be the image bearer of God. That is why you and I were created. I don't know if you've ever thought about that, but that's an awesome thing to think about. We were created to be the image bearer of God Almighty. And in chapter 2 of Genesis, we're fairly obligated by God's commandment, command to take of the tree of life and not the other tree. The implication there is that only God knows how we are to live to fulfill our obligation to be the image bearers of God. He's the one who sets the standard. He's the one who knows how we should carry that out. We can't decide that on our own. And yet that's just exactly what man decided to do. We must learn that the root of sin lies in the desire of men to live their lives in self-centered independence from God. To decide. That's how Satan tempted Eve. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. You can decide. You don't need this tyrant to tell you what's right and wrong. Don't you have a mind? Aren't you an intelligent being? And we bought it hook, line, and sinker, brethren. And we've been paying the penalty ever since. This is where the root of trouble is. This is what keeps us from being the image bearers of God that God intended us to be. If we deviate from this, have we not broken our obligation to God? Have we not missed the mark? If we go from that path, have we not sinned? We have broken our obligation to mirror and reflect the holiness of God because we rejected his standards. So we can't be his image bearer. Once we sin, we forfeit any claim to human existence. So is God unfair if being if something is so clearly stated? 
Are you beginning to see why he commands us to choose life? He sets before us two different ways. Remember, he, he put it before Israel. Therefore, choose life that you may live and your children may prosper. He set before him life and death, blessings and cursings, and he begged them to choose life. He sets before us two different ways. He commands us to go in a certain direction because if we go in the other direction, we have broken our obligation to be image bearers and then he is not obligated in any way to continue our lives. He is no under no obligation to continue the life that he gave you and I as a gift. And in doing so, God is not acting unfairly at all. There is no injustice. His commands are very clear. When the penalty was stated to Adam and Eve, did God say, if you sin, someday you will die? No. He didn't say that. The penalty is stated very clearly to be instant death. Now, there are some that try to get around that saying, well, oh, yeah, but what he meant was, see, a, a day to God is like a thousand years, so... He meant that you would die within a thousand year period. Uh, and I'm sorry, brethren, that's not the way, that doesn't reflect the Hebrew. It says, in the day you eat, you will die. Instant death. Just as suddenly as it fell on Nadab and Abihu and on Ananias and Sapphira and Uzzah. God meant the death penalty in the fullest sense of the word. The only reason that Adam and Eve lived was because it was right at that point that God extended grace. That's the only reason they continued to live. However, God was no longer obligated to continue their life. They had broken his word. They had deviated from the path. And the just thing for God to have done would have been to kill them just as surely and instantly as he killed Uzzah. But that's not what he did, though. Instead, he gave them mercy. He gave them grace. There is a saying that justice delayed is justice denied. But that's not always so. In this case, with Adam and Eve, the measure of justice was delayed for grace to have time to do its work. And now I hope, brethren, that we're thinking right now about this relationship thinking of this in relationship to ourselves. Because he's establishing a pattern here. You see, justice was delayed for grace to have time to work. In this case, the delay of justice was not the denial of justice, but the establishing of mercy and grace. So right at the very beginning of the book, in the third chapter, grace is already introduced. Those who say that the God of the Old Testament wasn't merciful or compassionate. Miss a very important point. Turn with me, if you will, now to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who has the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. The bondage of death, of course. The word release here, brethren, in the Greek means the same as somebody seeking a divorce, to break off something, to break an agreement. The death penalty is still imposed on Adam and Eve. And all men have died because all have come under the same, the death penalty for sin. The wages of sin is death. And all have sinned and come short of the glory of God and therefore die. In this sense, then, we are all living on death row. 
We instinctively or intuitively know this. That's why we fear death. Even though men do not know God, they intuitively understand that they're going to die. There's the record of history. And somehow there's also that feeling, that sense of their mortality within them, especially as, as we grow old and we see things start to fail. Again, I ask, is it unjust for a holy God to impose the death penalty for sin? We have broken our obligations. If you say it's unjust for God to impose the death penalty for sin, then since his justice is based on his holy character, what you're, you're doing is actually slandering God. You're slandering his holy character. You're saying, yes, God is unjust. You see, his justice is always in harmony with his righteousness. And I would have to conclude that if we say yes to that question, then we have never really come to grips with what sin is and what sin does and why God takes it so seriously. Brethren, we had better be able to answer that question with a resounding no, God is not unjust. And to be able to say no with conviction. Did you ever stop to think that when we sin, we were actually saying no to the righteousness of God. That we are telling him that his law, which is a represent representation of his character, as I said, is no good. We are telling him that our judgment is better than his. We are telling him that his authority is not over us. It does not apply to us. That we're above and beyond his jurisdiction. Is that what we're saying? We're telling him that we have the right to do whatever we want to do and not as he commands us. And no penalty should be attached to it. Brethren, sin with knowledge is simply treason. As surely as Benedict Arnold. It's an act of defiance. It's an act of rebellion. A revolutionary move against the supreme righteous authority of all creation. We would not even be alive without him. Think of that. We wouldn't even be here without him. We would not have hope without him. We could not look forward to eternal life without him. We would not understand any of his purpose without him. We could never have repented of our sins without him. We owe him everything. Everything. Did you also ever think that when we sin, we become false witnesses of God? Because we are the image bearers of God. We're supposed to reflect his holy character. And when we fail to do that, we're telling the world by our example that this is how the God is that we are the image of. Can we truly say, look at me and you will see the character of God? If our actions, brethren, belie God's character, we're sinning. And sin is against God. Remember what King David said after Bathsheba? When he was praying his prayer of repentance, he said, even though he had caused her to, do, uh, to be an adulteress, he had had her husband murdered. But notice what he says in his prayer. He says, David said, against you and you only, have I done this evil? Speaking to God. Now make no mistake. Sin also violates people in the process. There's nothing abstract about sin. Sin hurts people. It impairs their reputations. It crushes their dreams. It takes away from the quality of their lives. And when one dishonors God by sinning, one also dishonors and damages others who bear his image. Is it any wonder that God takes sin so seriously? When we, when we really begin to deeply analyze what sin does, the wonder is not that God occasionally executes justice as he did with Dadab and Abihu, but rather why he continues to let us live at all. Human nature is devious. 
Consider, consider Ecclesiastes 8, verse 11. You don't have to turn there, but you might want to write it down. Ecclesiastes 8, verse 11. Because the sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. You know, instead of seeing God's grace and not striking us dead immediately when we sin, we seem to think, wow, I got away with that. Oh, I could probably do this and get away with it too. You see what that's saying? Human nature is so devious that it can deceive even one who's converted to begin to take the grace of God for granted. Human nature has the tendency to pull the human being further and further into sin. If God does not execute his wrath and his justice immediately against a person, instead gives him grace, he gives him that person. What he's really wanting is that person to have an opportunity to continue to live longer in order that grace may be able to work in his life and that he may be led to repentance The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Says Jeremiah. We're still in Ecclesiastes. Maybe you should turn there. Why don't you go ahead and turn to Ecclesiastes 8. Ecclesiastes 8. Ecclesiastes 8. And we'll start with right after verse 11, which we just read, and we'll go to verse 12. Ecclesiastes 8, verse 12. Though a sinner does evil a hundred times, and his days are prolonged, yet I surely know that it will, it will be well with those who fear God, who fear before him, but it will not be well with the wicked, nor will he prolong his days, which are as a shadow, because he does not fear before God. You see, Solomon had enough wisdom, brethren, to understand that in the end, God would execute his justice. Perhaps the supreme folly of all is that man deceives himself that because it is customary to God for God to be patient, long-suffering, and slow to anger and forbearing of us, he will forget that his forbearance is designed to lead us to repentance. And instead of taking advantage of his patience, coming to him for forgiveness, some have a tendency to continue in our revolt through sin. The supreme folly of a converted person is to delude himself that somehow he's going to get away with it. You won't. Now the Old Testament, far from being a record of a warlike, belligerent, and wrathful God, is actually a revelation of extreme patience, mercy, and grace. When we really look at the Hebrew Scriptures, at the Old Testament, we see many examples of God's patience with mankind. Let's look, just look at some of them in the life of Abraham. Look at Genesis chapter 15. And see his mercy to Abraham. And his grace. Genesis 15, 13. This is God. Then he said to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them, and they will afflict them 400 years. And also the nation whom they serve, I will judge. Notice, I will judge. The great supreme judge promises Abram, that he will judge the nation that holds his descendants as slaves. Let's go on to read there in verse 14. Afterward they shall come out with great possessions. Now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace, and you shall be buried at a good old age. But in the fourth generation they, meaning your descendants, shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. God waited four 
generations for the for the Amorites to get so bad he that he felt as if it was an act of mercy to actually have them executed. He extended them, he or rather he executed them using the descendants of Abraham, the Israelites, the former slaves, the dis- coming into a land to dispossess them out of the land, the Amorites that they had lived in. And this should be a teaching lesson for you and I, brethren. We can learn from this that we have to wait when something like this is going on. We just have to wait until the righteous judge of all says the time is right for him to execute justice. We see, when we see something, we say, how is that, you know, why is that guy prospering? Why is that cheater prospering? And I'm playing by the rules. And I'm having a hard time. We have to understand that God was wait his, his patience, but justice will be executed. When the time, when he judges, the time is right. God began forming a nation from the descendants of Abraham, and they found themselves to be a nation of abject slaves whose every movement was subject to the whim of others. And so they complained. They murmured, as we find there in the opening book of Exodus. And it says that God heard their prayer and his and their pleas, and he by mighty miracles, by what it says, his mighty outstretched arm rescued them, and he redeemed them from their captivity. And he executed justice on the land of Egypt. He gave grace to the nation that he was calling out. He divided the Red Sea, and they went out. And how did they reward him? How did they treat his grace? They worshiped the golden calf. When you consider that, brethren, it's a miracle that he doesn't wipe us all off the face of the earth, as we all have the tendency to treat him that way sometimes. And these examples are given to us, brethren, so that we can see we are getting God's grace in tremendous abundance constantly. He does not owe us a thing. Yet, he gives us everything. You know, human nature has another quirk that's sort of interesting. In Deuteronomy chapter 9, God writes about these things for you and me so that we will understand. He was just about ready to bring Israel to the land, and he said this, Deuteronomy. Turn with me now to Deuteronomy. This is where... They're right on the, they're on the other side of the Jordan. They're getting ready to go in. And, it, and Moses is reiterating God's law to them, and he's getting them ready. Though he won't, himself won't be able to pass the Jordan. He's getting this people ready. And he says in Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 4, It says, do not think in your heart after the Lord your God has cast them, meaning the Amorites, the Canaanites, all the tribes that were there before you, saying, because of my righteousness, the Lord has brought me in to possess the land. But it is because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is driving them out from before you. You see, the iniquity of the Amorites was now full. It is not because of your righteousness or the uprightness of your heart that you go in to possess your land because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord your God drives them out before from before you and that he may fulfill the word which the Lord swore to your fathers to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Therefore, understand that the Lord your God is not giving you this good land to possess because of your righteousness for you are a stiff-necked people. He was executing justice, you see, on those nations and he was giving grace and mercy to the stiff-necked people. It's very easy sometimes, brethren, to delude ourselves into thinking that because God has been so gracious, he is somehow on our side, that somehow or another we we have a corner on him, so to speak. But remember, this is the God who says he judges without respect of persons He is totally fair. 
in his judgments of everybody. Do you see what his calling does, brethren? God is extending his grace to you and me. He therefore gives us a responsibility. The obligation is something that we are responsible for exercising. If we do not take advantage of what he has given to us, make no mistake, he will hold us accountable. He will, in Amos chapter 3, verse 2, you don't need to turn there. God says the following, Amos 3, verse 2. You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for your iniquities. He wants us to see the gifts, the calling, the election, the gifts of God, the Holy Spirit, the gift of forgiveness become the basis of our judgment. He has extended us grace, but this becomes the basis of our judgment, and this should be sobering. But brethren, consider what an advantage we have over the rest of the world. Because of God's favor, we have an opportunity to be in the first resurrection, to be so much more closely associated with him and his son through all eternity. There's no comparison. Remember, God chose us not because we were holy, not because we were so wise, not because of our righteousness. He chose us to make us holy. He loves you deeply. He is deeply concerned about you and I. But he cannot turn his back on us and on what he is. If he did, he would cease being God. If he did not constantly follow what he is, and so he cannot overlook persistent sinning because it is rebellion. No, there is no conflict between the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament. It was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob who so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2. We'll start with verse 21. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was guile found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. You see, Jesus wasn't concerned about seeking vengeance on his own against those who were doing this, he knew that his father would execute justice and judge righteously. This is the pattern. This is the model. Jesus Christ committed himself to the judgment of God who says he judges without respect of persons. He goes on to say in Second in 1 Peter, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Brethren, if you want my opinion about the most brutal example of, a, of divine justice, it is in the New Testament, not the Old. The most violent expression of God's wrath and justice is seen nowhere else but in the crucifixion. If there was anybody who had room to complain that he was not being treated fairly, it was Jesus Christ, who was not even guilty of one sin. He was the only innocent person who ever lived. And if we we're going to be upset or offended at something that is seemingly unjust, that would be it. You see, the crucifixion, like the flood and the casting out of the Amorites and so forth, is at one and the same time the most just and most gracious act in history. 
It would have been absolutely diabolical of God to punish Jesus if Jesus had not first taken on himself voluntarily, voluntarily, the sins of the world. And even though he was innocent up to that point, once he took upon himself that concentrated mass or load of sin, he became the most repugnant thing that ever existed on earth before God. He became an obscene and accursed thing. It says, He that is hung on a tree is accursed. He was accursed. And God, God executed his wrath. There was impartiality. God could not overlook sin even as it touched his own son. So it's a, it's a tremendous act of justice, but it's also the greatest act of mercy because you see Jesus Christ did it for us. Christ took the justice that was come to come on you and me and he paid it. It is that for us aspect that displays the majesty of God, the majesty, the majesty of the grace of God. You see, we are not really surprised that God has redeemed us because somewhere buried deep inside of us, there's the notion that God owes us something. Oh, we will acknowledge that we're sinners, but we're not really as bad as we could be. We imply that there's just enough redeeming good qualities in us that, you know, if I were God, I would find a place for me in his kingdom. Yeah. I'm a pretty good guy. I could... Now, what amazes us is God's justice, not God's grace. I, I read once of a college professor who, at the beginning of the school year, wanted to make it very clear to the 200, he had 250 students, and he wanted to make it very clear for those students in his class what the assignments would be. So, so he said, September 30th, September 30th, your first paper is due. There will be no extensions. October 31st, the second paper will be due. No extensions. And November 30th, the third paper, paper will be due. No extensions are going to be granted, period. Well, September 30th rolled around, and about 25 of his, of his uh, 150 students didn't have their papers. So they pleaded with the professor, and he gave them an extension of one day to turn in their papers. October 31st rolled around, and this time there were 50 of the students who did not have their papers in on time. And they again pleaded with him and said, please, professor, can we have more, one more day to get it done? So he said, OK. November 30th rolled around, and now there were a hundred of them who did not meet the deadline. And so the professor said, enough is enough. You're all getting Fs for that paper. That's not fair, they said. You extended it the last time. Well, the professor said, since the definition of fair is justice, if you want justice then, all of you who have missed the last two are going to get Fs for both of them now. Please, professor, give me only one. <laughs> now they were only satisfied with one F instead of two. See, once they began to realize that if they really got what they deserved, if they got justice, they really deserved three Fs because he made it abundantly clear. There will be no extensions. Unfortunately, the same tendency is in human nature for all of us to take the grace of God for granted and not appreciate it day by day, what he has truly given to us. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 27, God says this to Israel, Isaiah 40, verse 27. He says, Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my just claim is passed over by God. Now, what's Jacob saying here? What is Israel saying? They're saying, O oh God, you don't see how good I am. You're not treating me fairly. 
And so God replies in verse 28. Notice what he says. Have you not known, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary? His eyes are on his creation, and he knows exactly what's going on all the time, everywhere. He says, there is no searching of his understanding. God's normal activity in fire involves far more mercy than justice. And we have to operate with that understanding. The conviction that God owes us nothing. And he knows exactly what's going on. His eyes miss nothing. If he allows a tower to fall on my head this afternoon, I cannot claim any injustice from God. He's already given me so much mercy, it's beyond my understanding. All of us receive injustices from the hand of men, and we do not deal anywhere near as fairly with each other as we should. We want everything in our dealings with men to go favorably for us, and that's what we feel is fair. That is what Jacob was saying here. But one thing is certain. None of us have ever received the slightest injustice from the hand of God. As we grow in understanding and humility, we begin to see the grace of God we have received in overwhelming abundance. We have received truly an overwhelming abundance of grace. And brethren, it truly is an amazing grace.